A good morning. Amen. Any of you in here diabetics? Anybody a diabetic besides me? Hey, have you ever dreamed about food? Couldn't eat? I'm having a hard time this morning. I feel a little out of place. I, my favorite food's marshmallows. I dreamed last night I ate two 20-pound marshmallows. I got up this morning, my pillows were gone. I'm a little bloated, you know, today, so you pray with me, you know. We're going to have a lot of fun in God's Word. Need to pray for our pastor. Uh, he's in uh, Jerusalem today, thereabout, and uh, they're getting ready to move the American embassy into that city, and so it's going to be a rough time over there for the next three or four days, so pray for Randy as he's there. God bless him and take care of him in all that he endeavors to do. Well, you're going to have to follow along in your Bible because I didn't put everything up on. Boy, it's nice looking up there and seeing your name up there. I'll take a picture of that and send it to my wife so she'll know I was here, you know. My wife suffers from Alzheimer's and uh, being in large crowds and being around folks is very difficult on her. And uh, she said, I just want you to know that I'll listen to a good sermon this morning. I'll watch Dr. Batson down at First Baptist Church. So... Uh, <laughs> I told her, I said, well, uh, most of his sermons are ones that I gave him when he first came up here, so uh, we'll have a good time. How many of you knew Shad Rue? Anybody knew Shad Rue over Paramount Baptist Church? Shad and I were real good friends when I was pastor of First Baptist Church Shamrock. He'd come down and go fishing with me. Every Thursday he'd come down. One Thursday he came down, I noticed he was limping real bad. I said, Shad, what's the matter? He said, you know, I was preaching last Sunday and my knee gave out and I fell off the platform just about the time of the invitation. And he said over 300 people rushed down there to see if I was all right. He said one of my deacons said that's the sorriest way to get people to come to the front I've ever seen. <laughs> you know, so we're just going to have fun today. I'm glad to see you're laughing and smiling because if you're born again you ought to be happy. So many Christians today look like they've been baptized in pickle juice. They just, you can't make them happy about anything. They just are not happy. They don't know what it means to be happy. And they say, well, you don't understand what's going on in my life. I've got all these problems. Folks, you've never had near as many problems as Jesus has had. Amen? I mean, you read about the crucifixion, Jesus had a problem. Several years ago, they brought out a movie called the, about the crucifixion, and they showed all of that gory details, and I got sick watching it. You know, when they was beating that actor, I thought, man, if they really beat my Jesus like that, then I have the audacity to complain about what I'm going through. We ought to be excited about being born again. Everybody ought to jump up and down, scream, you know, just be happy, you know. It's exciting, but in church sometimes we just seem to shrivel up like a prune. I had a preacher friend of mine was preaching one time, and, and this guy came in, was visiting, and, and Larry said something neat, and this guy said, Amen, praise the Lord. And he scared Larry so bad he quit. He backed up and he started all over again. A few minutes later, this guy said something else. And this guy said, Amen, preacher, preach on. And one of the ushers came down forward and he tapped him on the shoulder and said, Sir, you're going to have to be quiet in the service. He said, But I got religion, but you didn't get it here. <laughs> you know, if we're, if we're afraid to let people know that we're born again, there's something wrong. That's what's the matter with America today. Christians have not stood up and proclaimed our rights to be heard as born again believers. I tell you what, people are talking today about what happened in the schools here not long ago where all these kids were shot. You can take that back to 1963 when this atheist declared that we needed to get God out of the schools and our schools have gone nowhere but downhill every day since we took God out of our schools. 
I want to tell you, as a young man growing up, there was lots of times I didn't get to go to church because I was working on Saturdays and Sundays. And the only time I got to hear about the Word of God is when our high school principal read and gave a devotional every day at Lubbock High School in Lubbock, Texas. We sat there between about 8 o'clock after classes time. He would come on and read Scripture and tell us about a short devotional. And many of us had to claim the promise that when the word is given, it will not return unto us empty and void. Later, when I was 17, I gave my heart to Jesus, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that someone was telling me about the word of God. That's what's the matter with our young people. They don't hear the word of God at school. That's what's the matter with our schools. I want to tell you, Christians ought to be happy. I want to read some scripture with you this morning. I want you to follow along the best you can. I'm going to preach on the theology of the rainbow. Anybody ever seen a rainbow? If you've never been to Niagara Falls, you ought to go. Me and my wife and our two children went to Niagara Falls about 15 years ago. And when you stand there at Niagara Falls, there is rainbow after rainbow after rainbow. I started counting them and I quit at 250 and there were rainbows everywhere. And I was just standing there looking at all of that beautiful rainbows and I thought, boy, isn't that wonderful. So God gave me the philosophy of the rainbow. I want to share it with you. People say, oh, you're crazy. That's all right. I'm screwed onto the right boat. But uh, in Romans chapter 18, or Romans chapter 8, if you would, you listen, or you can follow along with me if your Bible, if you have it. Romans chapter 18, verse 8 says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present times are not worthy to be compared with the glory which we shall reveal unto us. You know, all of the problems that we have today and all of the frustrations... I'm in my early 70s and I get up in the morning and I have to have a conversation with the rest of me. Foot, are you working? Leg, or are you working? Every now and then I get outside and I think, I can do the same thing that I used to do when I was 21 or 22. And I thought, well, I'm going to run a little bit. And my knee says, oh no, you're not. And I have to have a conversation with me and I think of all the problems and frustrations that I go through. Several months ago, I had surgery on my eye because I was driving down the road one day and I just couldn't see. Now, that'll scare you. You know, I put my finger over my good eye and I couldn't see anything. And I thought, well, I better open the other one then. <laughs> I used to complain. Then I realized that God said all of the things that we are endure is not even comparison to what we're going to see and what we're going to experience through Jesus. You know, I read about so many things that took place in the Old Testament. I read about Peter being crucified upside down. I read about Stephen's the deacon being beaten, and stoned to death, and all of these things that took place. But the scripture says none of that compares to the glory that we're going to see when, we, when we're with Jesus. Amen? Amen. You know, it's, it's amazing. Just recently I lost my brother. He passed away. He had Lou Gehrig's disease. I was in his home in Odessa when he passed away. His children were there and his wife's children. He'd been married once before. She had five children. He had two children. And they were all grown now in their 40s. And there was a host of grandchildren and great-grandchildren there. And I was standing there and one of the little boys said, Uncle Dan? And I said, what? Because he'd been bugging me all day. You know how kids are. They'd be bugging you, you know. He said, what's Papa going to be like in heaven? What's it going to be like for him? And I said, well, what do you want to know? Well, is he going to look the same? And so I sat down and I tried to explain to this child that one of the greatest gifts that God gives us when we're saved is that when death comes, God's going to take us home with the angels. Amen? Now, Hollywood rarely ever gets anything right spiritually in the movies. Have you noticed that? They never do. 
But I watched the show several years ago and I, I bought a copy just because of it. Have you ever seen the movie Ghost? They get it right in the death scenes. When a man dies without Jesus, Satan's angels come after him. And when a man dies with Jesus, God comes after him. Now, you, you don't think much about that, but when you think about dying, when you think about in that moment that death is going to come, the greatest gift you have is that someday in your life, somewhere, you knelt down on your knees and you said, Jesus, would you come into my heart? Will you forgive me of my sins? And will you save me? And Jesus said, if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, thou shall be saved. Now, our pastor is really cool in Greek. And he will tell you that that shall be saved is in the emphatic perfect tense. It means you're saved now, you're saved tomorrow, you're saved next week, you're saved five years from now, you're saved 20 years from now. Folks, there is no such thing as losing your salvation once you're saved. Amen. You can't lose it. And because you're saved and God has written your name in the Lamb's book of life, when death comes, He's going to take you into His presence. Isn't that great? It is. That's great. Now, when you think about no matter what we go through from the time that we're saved until the day that we die, none of that can equal the glory that we're going to receive when we stand in the presence of God. When we get there, Paul's grandson or great-grandson said, Uncle Dan, do they eat in heaven? You ever thought about that? Do they eat in heaven? I know one thing. I wouldn't want to spend eternity with, without something to eat. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of on the piggy side. I, I like eating. You know, I like marshmallows and I like donuts. And I can't eat them now, but there's coming a day I will get to eat them. Because I'm going to get a new body and, a, and I'm going to get a, a new beginning and I don't have to worry about what's hurting. When I get up in the morning, I don't have to worry about arthritis. Yeah, we're going to have something to eat. And, you know, I got to looking in Scripture and uh, my wife said, you need to be able to write that down for him and tell him about that because he may not always remember it. And the Scripture says... As they spake, Jesus stood in the midst of them, and he said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they being terrified and afraid, supposed that they had seen a spirit, he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do your thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my feet. Behold my hands and my feet. That is, I myself handle me and see. A spirit has not flesh or, or blood or bones, as you have seen. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands. And while they were there, he said, Have you meat? And they gave him a piece of uh, boiled fish and a honeycomb. And he ate. Here we're going to eat in heaven. You know, we're going to have a real nice body when we get in heaven. I won't have to put my teeth in a jar anymore. Amen? Ever been there? I won't have to go looking for my glasses. I get up in the middle of the night and then I want to go somewhere. I tell you what, I've got more broken toes for not being able to see in the middle of the night. I won't have that problem anymore. We had the company come spend a, a couple of nights with us several months ago and says, Danny, you got more night lights in your house than anybody I've ever seen. I said, yeah, I do. And he said, well, isn't it expensive? Not as expensive as going to the emergency room for a broke toe. <laughs> you see, I can't always find my glasses, but I can always see the light. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? No matter what we go through, it's not going to be as near as bad as we think it is. I want to read you some verses of Scripture that talks a little bit about the rainbow. Jesus had these things to say, beginning in verse 31 of this chapter. Who shall then say to these things, If God be for us, 
who can stand against us. Amen? If you're saved, you don't have to put up with the Satan standing against you because he cannot stand against you only if you let him. Amen? Now you're getting awful quiet. <coughs> Do you believe you have power over Satan in your life? You ought to believe it because Jesus gave us that power when he saved us. He said, I will never allow anything to tempt you that you don't have the power to overcome. You don't have to put up with it. I had a church member one time. His name was Brother Cooper. He was as hard as hearing. He couldn't even hardly hear it thunder. He had one of the old timey hearing aids. He kept it like a you remember those old radios we used to have that had the earplug on them? He had one of those hearing aids set in his pocket. He'd stick it in his ear. And when his wife began to bother him, he would make real sure that she saw him. He'd reach over and turn it off. <laughs> and when I was preaching, if he didn't like what I was preaching, he'd just kind of wave at me and turn it off. There's always a way. God has provided a way. When things get bad for you, he'll provide a way out for you. With Brother Cooper, his way of getting out of it was just turning it off. Now you can turn the world off if you're willing to turn it off simply by getting in your Bible and reading what God says. Amen? I get so tired of listening to Fox News. Anybody in here watch Fox News? Anybody? Don't be ashamed. If you watch it, raise your hand. My wife said, what are you so mad about? I said, we've been talking about the same thing for nearly two years now and nobody has done anything. The biggest problem that we have, we know what things are bad and what things are wrong in our life and what things we should be doing, but we don't ever do anything to solve them. How do you solve them? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing what? By the reading of God's Word. You have a problem in your life? God said, I'll give you the answer. Just read your book. I said that to a lady one time. She said, I don't read it. And I said, how come? She said, I don't always like his answer. <laughs> That's really cool, isn't it? A lot of people only want to read the portions of their Bible that says something nice to them. They don't want to read that point over there like the Ten Commandments where it says, Thou shall not steal. Now folks, you can't argue with that. Well, I'm not sure what he meant. Well, he said, Thou shall not. What part of no don't we understand? Amen? Don't do it. Thou shall not commit adultery. What part of that don't you understand? Don't do it. Thou shall not covet. What part of that don't you understand? Don't do it. Let me tell you something about God. He is not as complicated as everybody makes him out to be. When my mother told me not to do something, I knew not to do it. And the reason why I knew not to do it was my mother had a habit of saying, Son, go out in the yard and get me a switch. i go out and get one like this. She'd say to my brother Paul, Paul, go get him a switch. My brother would come in with something about this long and about that big around. It did not take me long at all when I got whooped several times about doing things that my mother and daddy told me not to that I found out real quick. Don't do it. Don't do it. I have a real good friend of mine who's a doctor. I went to him about four or five years ago and I said, Wayne, my wrist, I think I must have broke it or sprang it. Every time I turn it sideways like this, it nearly kills me. He said, I can fix that. And I said, oh, goodness gracious, thank you, Wayne. I said, what am I going to do? You going to give me some medicine, give me a shot? No, just don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. I said, wait a minute. I need to move it. He said, not as much as you think you do. Just don't do it. 
I have found out if people would just quit doing what God told them not to do, their life is a hundred times better. Amen? It always is. I want to give you a promise here from God that says this. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died and that is risen again, who is ever at the right hand of God making intercession for us. If you have a problem, God is at the right hand of God talking to God about what your problem is, and he'll give you strength to overcome it. People say, well, preacher, you're dumb. I don't believe that. Well, let me give you two or three of experiences that I've, I've had that make me sure that God does that. When I was 17, I had a 54 Ford. Anybody ever had an old Ford? I had one of those had a glass top in it. Remember those? From front seat, half of it up was a... Everybody said, oh, I want one of those now. Let me tell you, if you had one, you wouldn't want it living in West Texas because they didn't come with air conditioners. And the sun coming through that glass roof in those days was a really, really bad situation. I had to spray paint mine black just to keep the sun from coming in. Anyway, me and Linda were dating, and she had to be home at a certain time, and I had to be home at a certain time. So I was flying around to the beginning of Loop 289, where it went across Clovis Highway. I was just flying along. Oh, I got to get home, I got to get home. I had a 390 in that old Ford. It would run. It was fast. It was even fast by today's standard. It would just really run. And I run up the side of the overpass, and when I got to the top of the overpass, they hadn't built a road there yet. And I jumped a 54 Ford completely across the Clovis Highway in Lubbock. I was so scared that I pulled up on the steering wheel so hard that I broke it off in my hand thinking that airplane or that car might fly. <laughs> it didn't. And I told the Lord, Lord, if you get me out of this thing alive, I'll be good. And he got me out of it alive. Several months later, I was back doing some things and God reached off and tapped me on the shoulder. He said, I could have let you die, but I've got something in store for you. So do what I tell you to do. And it wasn't long after that God called me to preach. It wasn't long after that I got to preach my first sermon. It wasn't long after that that I got moved into my first church. I was the youngest pastor ever called to a church in Lubbock, Texas at the time. Full-time pastor. I was barely 20 years old when I started pastoring. People in my church had children older than me. I had a guy tell me, he says, Pastor, I love you, but it's hard for me to listen for you to tell me what to do. It's like listening to one of my children telling me what to do. I don't want any part of that. Let me tell you something and make it very plain. If God is for you, he will do everything in the world to keep you healthy and happy. Amen? You've got to help. You've got to help. Well, God's going to take care of me. I can go play in the traffic on I-40. If I'm going to be alive, it's going to be all right. No, don't be dumb. You know, don't be dumb. You've got to do your part. You've got to make the right decisions. But God says, no one can lay anything to the elect's feet because I am the one who takes care of them. I get up every morning thanking God that I don't have to go through what Jeremiah went through. You ever read the book of Jeremiah and the book of Lamentation? They kicked his teeth out for preaching the gospel. They broke his bones. They drug him through the street. Then he wrote, I am persuaded it's by the mercies of God that I'm not consumed. Me, I would have been yelling and screaming at somebody. God's going to take care of you. You ever been in a hospital? That's when most people pray. You ever notice how... how Prayerful post people get. I had a guy in my church, at First Baptist Church, Seagrace. I'd go to his house, and every time we'd gather around to pray, well, he'd find a reason to go in the kitchen, get a drink of water or something, so we ended up praying with his wife and a couple of kids. But he got real bad sick, had a heart attack. He was over in Brownfield Hospital, and when I walked in the room, first thing he wanted to do was pray. It's amazing when we get in trouble how quickly we turn to God. But if we stay with God, it's amazing how little our trouble is. Stay close to God.
Now get these verses. Here comes the rainbow. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations, which means testing, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or stress, or peril, or sword? It is written, for our sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors, though through him that loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, our angels, our principalities, our powers of anything present or anything to come, nor height nor death or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. Now you listen to me very closely. Your sin cannot separate you from God. You're saved. You're always going to be saved. Your sin can separate you from the joy of his fellowship. People who want to live outside of God after they're saved, they're unhappy and they're depressed and they're wrung out and they're miserable and they tell you, well, I don't want to go to church. I used to go to church, but I didn't like what the preacher said. It doesn't matter what the preacher says. God said, come to church. Didn't he say that? Didn't he say that in the book of Hebrews? Forsake not the assembling of yourself together on the first day of the week to worship who? The Lord. Listen, folks. Life is tough on us. Being a Christian is not a rose garden party. It's tough. But remember, we've got God. Now, I told you there a little bit about the philosophy of the rainbow. Well, what is the philosophy of the rainbow? However, have you ever seen a beautiful rainbow? You see it? Isn't it wonderful? You cannot have a rainbow without the rain, the thunder, and the lightning. Just don't work that way. I, I've driven around West Texas in a snowstorm, never saw a rainbow. I've driven around West Texas in the fog and never saw uh, a rainbow. Right after it rains and I'm running in the house to get out of the rain or the lightnings, uh, going real bad and the thunder's going real bad my old dog's trying to get in the house and you know he's tearing up the back porch oh let me in let me in I'm afraid you cannot have a rainbow without the thunder and the lightning that's the reason why God gave the rainbow after he destroyed the earth with water he said look up here I'm not going to do this anymore this way I'm not going to do this ever again, but I want to put this up here to let you know I'm going to take care of you. For however long Noah was in the boat, and however long the water was upon the face of the land, God took care of Noah. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? He didn't have a problem. He thought he had a problem, but he doesn't have a problem. I had a lady tell me just this past week, Pastor, I just got back from the doctor. I have cancer in the fourth stage, he said, I may have six to eight months to live. And I said, well, what do you want me to say? She said, I don't want you to say anything. I just want you to know that I'm dying. And I said, well, maybe God will work a miracle. She said, you don't understand. I've been a Christian all my life. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I never worried about dying until I knew I was dying. But after worrying about it for a few minutes, I come to understand what God says. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And I said, yes, what are you trying to tell me? Everybody dies of something. Amen? Anybody know anybody that's died this year? You never know when it's going to happen. My good friend Mike sitting back there lost his mother this year. Just like that. But she was ready to meet Jesus. I know she was. Because we were good, good, good friends. Really good friends. We had a lot of fun in the Lord together. Every Christian in this room is going to die. 
You may die of a heart attack. You may die of cancer. You may die of someone shooting you. You may die in a car wreck. But every one of us in this room are going to die. Now the point is, are you ready to receive the glory of God? Aren't you going to be glad? Brother Winford Dollar was a good friend of mine. He's going on to be with the Lord. Was a deacon for years and years and years. Love working with him. Love being around him. He's in heaven. He's got a body. And when Miss Dollar gets ready, they'll be together again. You see, that's the glory of God. My brother is walking the streets of gold. That's the glory of God. Did he have a right to walk the streets of gold? Only in the fact that Jesus died on the cross for him. If Jesus hadn't died on the cross for him, he has no right to the kingdom of God. Only Christians are going to heaven. Amen? Do you believe that? Only Christians are going. Nobody up there is going to be up there but born again believers. Now I'm going to get funny here for a minute. And let me tell you, there are going to be some people up there that you thought wasn't going. Amen? You're going to get there and say, well, my Lord, what's he or she doing here? It's not dependent upon me. It's not dependent upon you. It's dependent upon the power of Almighty God and the blood that He shed on Calvary's cross to wash me and to cleanse me and to make me whole so that when death comes, I'll stand before Him. Now let me tell you something else about your dying. You're not going to take anything with you. Amen? You work all your life for having a nice, nice home. I've known some people that if you walked into their homes, they'd follow you around with a rag. Wherever you put your hand, they'd wipe the fingerprints off. This is my castle. I got news for you. You can't take it with you. Amen. I used to get mad at my grandchildren. I remember my children when they would mark on the walls with Crayolas. And my father-in-law was a deacon. And he finally said to me one day, Son, you need to realize. What? What do I need to realize? Paint is cheap. I said, what does that mean? Paint the wall again. Don't scream at a child for being a child. Just paint the wall. She'll get out of it. And I thought, what do you know? <laughs> By the time she got four or five years old, painting on the wall was over with. And I said, you know, he's right. Now get this, if you get nothing else, everything about your life is going to change where you think it will or not. Amen? I better not say that. No, what the heck, I, I ain't pastor, I can get by with it. <laughs> There are many beautiful young ladies in this congregation this morning. Very beautiful. But one day, you're going to be old and gray. And you'll say, that's not going to happen to me. You want to bet? <laughs> you want to bet? You might say, well, I'll take better care of myself. It doesn't matter how good you take care of yourself. You're going to get old. And you're going to find it's hard to get up out of that chair. It's hard. When my knees went bad, I had an old bark lounger chair that I, I couldn't hardly get up out of, and so I had to build it up six inches higher so that my backside wasn't slanted down, it was slanted forward so that I could get up out of it. <laughs> You're going to change. And what you like today, you may not like it tomorrow. You just never know what's going to happen. You just never know. You need to understand we are like sheep going to the slaughter. Things are going to happen to us that we wish never happened to us, but we need to understand one thing. God says nothing in this world can ever separate you from my love. 
Now, have you ever told your girlfriend or your boyfriend, I don't love you anymore? It happens. Especially among teenagers. Oh, this week they're in love and then nothing else matters. This is the one. Two weeks later, I don't want to ever see that guy again or I never want to see Everything changes. But God said, I'll tell you this about my love for you. It will never change. You cannot be bad enough to change my love for you. Every lost person in this world is, is a is lost and without God, but Jesus said, I love you so much, I'll go to the cross for you. Love doesn't change. Now, I've done some things in my life that I'm not proud of, but God did not throw me away because of it. I was in Jamaica, one, no, it wasn't Jamaica. Where's the, where's the country that has a gigantic cross down in South America, up on the side of the hill? What? Brazil. What's the name of the town down there? What? Rio. Isn't that it? Anyway, I was down there preaching a revival. I had my daughter with me, and I had uh, several other ladies in, the, in Albert Green. You remembered Albert Green? Uh, Albert Green was with us. We were down there doing a crusade. Walking down the street, my 14-year-old daughter is walking in front of us, and this kid jumps out with a broken bottle and tries to hit her with a broken bottle. And while he was doing that, another kid came up behind me, stuck his hand in my pocket and tore my pocket completely out of my pants so that they could get to my billfold. Well, I'm an airplane pilot. I fly and I own my own airplane at the time. And so I had a pair of real nice glasses where I just tore them around my hands like I would then do. And I swung and I hit that child right there in the face with those mirror glasses and it just drove that, all that into his, his uh, face. And he went to screaming, and this other kid stepped towards my daughter, and I hit him. He couldn't have been 13, 14 years old, uh, but I didn't care. I hit him as hard as I could, and I knocked him over the hood of a little old Datsun. It just blew right over. Here come the police. And so I said to my daughter, I'm going to jail, so call your mother. You know, <laughs> tell her I'm going to be late. <laughs> I'm going to be down here for a while. And I walked up and this policeman grabbed me by the hand. I thought he was going to put handcuffs on me. He shook my hand and says, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I said, what? He said, we got street gangs like this all over. I'm glad somebody finally did something about it. And I'm thinking, I don't know what you're thanking me for. I nearly killed this little boy. I, you know, his face was all cut up and the other one was hurt. I felt bad about hurting somebody. There are things that you do in your life that is not a good witness. But God doesn't throw you away because of it. Matter of fact, Albert Green bought my supper that night because of it. You see, some, out the, some things that you think are bad, God will bless you for just simply because you were there. God's love for you will never change. I like that. I can't do anything to make God stop loving me. Now people say, well, preacher, you can get so far. Yeah, you can get so far away from God that when you stand before God, He may not give you one reward, but at least you're in the kingdom of God. I'm one of these from West Texas. I'm just glad to get in. Some people say, well, I, I want to be up front. And I want to do all. Me, I'm just going to be glad to be sitting like these people are on the very back row. Just be glad to get in. <laughs> Amen. I haven't done anything for Jesus. Well, you've preached a long time. Yes, I preached a long time. But that's not doing anything compared to what Jesus done for me on the cross. Aren't you glad you're saved? Yes. Aren't you excited about it? Yes. Amen. You know, one of the greatest ways you can be excited about it is to tell somebody about it. Amen. Grab somebody and hug them tight and tell them. Why well, hug them tight? They can't walk away from you. <laughs> Put your arm around with them. I love you, I love you, I love you. Can't get them off of you. Get excited. Get excited. It's amazing. How many churches are no longer excited? No longer excited. In my younger days, I used to do dumb things while I was pastoring. I was 20 years old, so maybe God forgave me. But I couldn't get anybody to come to training union. Do y'all remember? Nobody in here old enough to remember training union. Training union was a, was a program we had on Sunday night to train people how to teach and how to witness. And so 
I couldn't get anybody to come, so that Sunday morning when people came to church, I had a casket sitting in the, in, in the front of the church. And uh, I had it closed, and had the flowers on it, looked just like we were having the funeral. And somebody said, who's in that casket? I said, well, I can't tell you. Not right now, I'll tell you later, you know. So had two guys in our church that worked for the funeral home. I asked them to come out. They walked down, they opened the casket, and it was sitting down in there. You couldn't look, you just couldn't, you had to get up there to see. And when people started filing by, all they saw was their own reflection. I had a mirror in the bottom of that casket. And they said, what does this mean? It means our church is dead. We're just waiting for somebody to put us in the box. If you're not winning people to Jesus, then you're missing what people ought to be doing. Tell somebody about Jesus. Right? Amen. Tell somebody about Jesus. You'd be surprised where you find people who will witness. For a long time I worked out at the prison. While I was building the Lighthouse Baptist Church, we didn't have enough congregation to, to really pay me a salary, so I went to work for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. I rode a horse and carried a gun a lot out there, and, and inmates were working for me. And uh, this inmate walked up to me one time. He had to be 50 years old, and we were doing something. And he walked up to me, and he said, Mr. Lucas, can I talk to you for a moment? I said, yeah, sure can. What you need? He said, I just want to tell you God loves you. And I said, what? He said, God loves you. I just want to share with you. I just came out of church. And our chaplain out here says, we need to witness to people. And he said, I don't mind witnessing to inmates. They're easy. But he said, I thought I'd thought with well, a hard one. I'd talk to you. <laughs> I thought, why so? My witness must be really great in this place that he thought I was the hard one to witness to. You need to understand God will use anybody anywhere to get something across to you. Amen? You ever had God tell you something you didn't want to listen? Surely you haven't. Nobody's that hard-hearted like I was. God tell me lots of things. And he would eventually say, Son, you just need to listen. The world would have already been one to Jesus if we'd just listen. Well, how do you know? Go ye into all the world telling them the gospel. And lo, I'm with you always, even till the ends of the world. Aren't you excited? We're going to come. We're going to give an invitation. If you want to come and rededicate your life, you want to come and just kneel and ask God to make you a soul winner, then you do whatever God wants you to do. We're going to have a short invitation. I don't need to beg people to come. If you want to come, if you're excited, if you've not been living for Jesus, you come right now as our a team assembles. We're going to just ask you to come. We're going to have a word of prayer as they're coming. And I'm going to open this altar up to you. Perhaps there's someone here in this church that's been really special to you. You want to go hug their neck and tell them you love them. That would be a wonderful thing to do on such a fine day in God's house. May we pray together.